is having us there. Um, I think that's most of the logistics. So now I'm really excited to introduce Will McCaskill to kick the conference. Will is the Associate Professor in Philosophy at uh, and a research fellow at the Global Priorities Institute, the University of Oxford. His academic research focuses on the fundamentals of effective altruism, the use of evidence and reason to help others as much as possible with our time and money. Uh, he particularly focuses on how to act given moral uncertainty. Uh, he's the author of Doing Good Better and Moral Uncertainty, and he also has an exciting upcoming book called What We Owe to the Future. He's the director of the Full Thought Foundation uh, for the Global Priorities Research, and he's a co-founder and the president of the Centre for Effective Altruism, CEA, um, and he's been instrumental in creating the Effective Altruism, mm -hmm. Effective Altruism Movement. There we go. Please welcome us to the stage. Thank you so much, um, and hello EA Global. It's, good to, it's amazing to see so many people from EA Global X. It's like extremely exciting. Um, so okay, in this talk, I'm going to you know briefly talk about one of what I think everyone saw as the most major development over the course of the pandemic, which um, was the move to Long Everton, <laughs> um, as evidenced by Benjamin Todd. But the development you're less you know might be surprised about is how that's the tide has turned. And now Rob is a short hairist. I, as of last week, become a short hairist. Um, and even Ben himself, in big news, is actually going to be uh, leaving, stepping down as CEO of 80,000 Hours in order to pursue a career as a hair model. <laughs> he looks a little different in that, but it, it is him. Uh, so this conference doesn't have a theme, but I think the unofficial theme is um, that given by Habiba Islam in, his, in her talk, uh, which will be later today, which is aim high and do good. And the last year, Global London as well, had this unofficial theme of be ambitious. Now, why are we starting to talk in those terms, thinking big, aiming high, being ambitious? Well, I think there's two reasons. One is the um, just track record to date, and second is just the resources we have under our disposal now. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, in terms of track record, I mean, the, big, the, most clear, the clearest is the work in global health and development. So GiveWell has now moved or raised um, well over a billion dollars uh, for its top recommended charities. Um, in case of, case of Against Malaria Foundation, uh, they've now protected 400,000 people um, against uh, malaria. And uh, the kind of order of like life saved, um, that $5,000 to save life is about 200000 So for reference, that's considerably larger than the population of Oxford that we're living in. Um, I think one of the heartening things about this is that uh, despite having moved $400 million against Malaria Foundation, still has this 19 0 website, um, <laughs> which they have refused to change um, on efficiency grounds for a full 12 years now. Um, so it's not just within global health and development, um, enormous uh, impact within especially corporate cage fee campaigns as well. Uh, so largely as a result of um, advocacy from groups like the Humane League and Mercy for Animals, um, the number of, the proportion of hens no longer kept in cage conditions in the US is now up to about a third from 7% um, a number of years ago. That's about 100 million animals um, every year which is, again, just this enormous, enormous positive impact. Um, in other areas, too, um, so like the field of AI safety, I mean, maybe this is even the one that kind of blows my mind most. I've seen this field of worrying about uh, catastrophic risks from artificial intelligence go from just the fringiest of kind of fringe concerns, if I think about the kind of discussions that were happening at Future of Humanity Institute a decade ago, um, to now being like really just pretty respected mainstream um, topic of discussion and area of research where leading AI labs such as DeepMind um, have labs focused on AI safety. Uh, there's also just more interesting recent developments as well, like new projects getting set up. So over the course of the pandemic, a couple of organizations that were created. One is um, One Day Sooner, 
that was advocating for the use of human challenge trials where healthy volunteers who are willing to be infected um, can volunteer for a trial. So you can get much faster data on how well um, a vaccine works. Uh, Alvia is a brand new organization, very, very exciting. Maybe the organization of the last couple of months that I'm like, most excited about. Um, it developed the first, created by, um, again, people in the EA community, uh, created the first um, Omicron-specific um, vaccine uh, to be tested on mammals. Um, and already is on the way to have uh, um, clinical trials. Um, still unclear kind of quite how quickly they'll be able to get um, FDA approval, um, but they're really moving fast and it's really impressive work. And you can see how these things could um, kind of stack together such that, you know, this pandemic, I think the world um, did not so great a job. I think that's also true for um, the EA community. But we can be better prepared for future pandemics. And so between these, you can imagine if another pandemic broke out, we could have a vaccine within days um, via human challenge trials and rapid scale up capacity. We could have a clinically approved vaccine within weeks. This could obviously be transformative for any future pandemics. Um, and kind of taking the time to reflect on all this, uh, I don't know, I think like when I was an undergraduate, which I think many of you are, um, I, among with like very many people who were very influenced by Peter Singer's arguments, the mental state was that kind of angst um, or feeling of kind of hopelessness where the moral arguments were very compelling, that there was this enormous um, urgency and obligation to help, but then just this thought of like, well, what do you even do? Um, and it was just a kind of, felt like a quagmire. Um, whereas, you know, one update I've had over the last 12, 14 years is like, okay, you know, if you try, then you really start, can start making a positive impact. So thinking about some of the ways in which we've had, you know, we actually have turned effort um, into positive impact, is one reason for thinking like, hey, let's maybe even think bigger. The second is just the kind of the scale of the resources in the EA community now as well. So in terms of members, you know, you could look at the Given What We Can pledges, which are pledges of at least 10% of your income, now um, 7,000. And that will only represent, um, you know, a sizable but not whole fraction of the community. And the other, like, very obvious thing that has been a big development over the last year is just increase in um, financial assets as well. So between Open Front P and um, the Future Fund now, uh, we are in a position where um, there are tens of billions of dollars that are really looking to be spent um, as effectively as possible, and ideally as, you know, as quickly as makes sense as well. Um, and I think just two things about that. Um, one is just an incredible opportunity. So what are the ways in which there's an opportunity? Well, larger resources means you can do more good. It's kind of a, it's maybe an obvious one. Um, but it gives, you know, the efforts that we have, like, an extra urgency. Um, it also makes changes to dynamics where, uh, early on in the effects of autism community, all the thinking was on the margin. So, you know, 2009, me and Toby were thinking about, like, how do we spend our donations? It's like a few thousand pounds or something, and you're choosing between existing organizations. You're a very small part um, of the world or the field you're um, working in. Whereas now it's more like, oh, we actually have the capacity to create new things. Um, if we think that the projects or organizations that are potentially even more impactful than those that exist now. Uh, I think the resources we have also just give us the opportunity to attract a wider diversity of um, people too, where, you know, it's no longer the case. Um, uh, so yeah, I have a friend visiting and I showed them the first CEA office, which is just down the road, but it's in this estate agent. You go down the stairs and it's in the basement. And it's like window, it has a single like small window and that's where we had 12 people working kind of found together. Um, it wasn't clear it was legal. Um, <laughs> but that was the kind of like, and everyone's on like 15,000 pounds per year. That was the kind of start. And obviously that's just like not the sort of life that is attractive or um, possible for very many people. Whereas here and now it's like, actually we can start attracting people who still have both of their kidneys or um, uh, who are coming from like um, financial backgrounds that such a levels of financial sacrifice um, would have made it much harder obstacles to be working with these things. And that's, I think, very exciting. So this gives us an incredible opportunity. 
Um, it's also an enormous responsibility. Um, and as, you know, as the stakes get larger, as we have more resources, that just means you know, we have the potential for doing more good, we also have the potential for doing more harm, we also have the potential for squandering that opportunity. And that's really important to bear in mind. Um, I think there are various ways um, in which making, you know, we can fail to make the most of this. So one is by responding in harmful ways. You can imagine the community getting very bloated. Um, you can imagine just there being like thousands of new organizations and none of them ever get shut down because people always, you know, like their own thing. Um, or things just get very slow and um, there's no longer this kind of, the incentive that you get um, in virtue of, uh, you know, not being sure whether you can keep fundraising into the future. So that's one. Another would be mission theft. Um, this is the flip side of just, again, being um, able to pay closer to kind of comparable salaries from other organizations um, is, oh, well, there's a worry that, um, you know, it's no longer people who are as actually focused, like, utterly on trying to make the world better. Or another worry is just you start focusing on these big glittery things, things that like sound like they're very impressive, because you know, you've got this big budget, or you've got like, there's lots of people, but maybe that's just not the most impactful thing. Claire Zabel has this excellent blog post where at the end of the blog post, um, she expresses a bunch of angst about this, that you know, it's, for her as a funder, a grant maker, she is maybe incentivized to think, oh, there's ways, you know, great ways of doing good with enormous amounts of money. Um, but perhaps that's not the case, and actually, um, uh, actually, it's just funding is not the bottleneck at all. If that's the case, we just need to be open to that. And then the final thing is just, um, in terms of responsibility, just never forgetting the opportunity cost as well. There are just extremely scalable ways of spending money. Um, Give directly, which I believe we're going to hear about this weekend, is one of them. And this does an enormous amount of good um, with every dollar you give it. Uh, I think there are plausible other scalable uses of money in pandemic preparedness, um, in clean en energy as well. And so we shouldn't ever forget that there's this very high bar for how we're using funds, how we should be using funds. And so taking that all together, what does aiming high mean? Well, I think it doesn't mean that every idea gets funded um, and doesn't get funded indefinitely. I mean, you can think of like a startup ecosystem uh, where what happens there is like, well, there's loads of new projects if there's some kind of new source of, in their case, profit. Um, but does that mean they continue indefinitely? No, 90%, maybe 99% buy. And that's maybe just a healthy ecosystem. And that's harder to maintain in the nonprofit world um, because, um, you know, perhaps donors are not as cutthroat as um, profit and loss. But it might well be the right thing. It could even be that we end up setting up one project that just has better cost effectiveness per dollar and is enormously scalable. Against Malaria Foundation has um, absorbed $400 million and has a team of 10 people, which is why the website is still so janky. Um, but the web jankiness of the website is not very important. They're able to do this enormous amount of good with a very small amount of um, money. And that could well be the way that things develop. Um, it's also the case that we shouldn't just immediately launch just, like the biggest thing you can imagine. Uh, I think very often the way to build a very healthy, thriving organization is by starting a small, nimble, and lean and that forces you to be uh, creative in how you're doing things. And then finally, we just shouldn't drop our standards for labor and self scrutiny. We should always bear in mind the opportunity cost. But what does it mean as a positive? Um, well, I think it means we should just, we take really seriously um, the many, many, many problems the world faces um, and the responsibility we have to act uh, to tackle those problems. It does mean that we should take very seriously just how much we could do if we really try. Um, and that does mean making bold plans. It does mean thinking big. It also means being willing to fail, perhaps repeatedly. Um, but more than anything, it means that we should be just trying to work as hard as we can to make the world better. Thank you.